Okay, kids. Go ahead and get on your pajamas, brush your teeth, and get all cozy there in bed. It's, it's time to um, do a little storytelling with Kurt Thompson. Storytelling with Kurt Thompson, Music 101. And we're going into the private affairs of composers and some behind the scenes, some trivial information that's not usually told in those 1500 page music history books that you get in college. So we're going to continue on with um, Brahms. Brahms. B R A H M S. Brahms. Everybody knows Brahms, and probably you guys do too. Because as soon as you hear, hear the name Brahms, you immediately think of. Da da dee da 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 Right, Brahms Lullaby, we've all heard it. So, like, unlike some of the more obscure composers that we've gone over already, you, de you definitely know Brahms, even if you didn't study too much about music. But, let's be fair, there was more to Brahms than that lullaby. He also wrote a requiem. And, if you want to impress your friends, you could refer to his famous lullaby as the Weingenlied, Opus 849, number 4. That's the da 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 If you have friends who are impressed by that sort of thing, you're welcome to them. Johann Brahms was born in 1833 in Hamburg, where his parents were living at the time. Obviously, they must have been living there. And da 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 His father, Jacob, or Jakob, however they're going to pronounce it over there, was a double bass player, though not very good at it. His mother, Christine, was a seamstress. She was 41 when she married Jakob and 17 years older than he was. Whoa! So Brahms' father went for the older chicks, apparently. It was an odd match. Young Johann got his early musical training from his father, although his mother may have contributed to his ability to weave complicated melodic lines into the fabric of his music. Hmm. Okay, so I was just looking at a footnote there. Money was always scarce when Brahms was growing up, and even as a young boy, he supplemented the family's income by playing the piano in some of the seedy bars and taverns in the dockyards. He didn't enjoy it very much, but it was a living. Okay, let's keep it going. Although most of us picture Brahms as he was in later life, sloppy looking with a bushy white beard, long gray hair, and baggy clothing, the truth is, he was once a slim, blue-eyed, blonde, and considered quite handsome. It shows what can happen when you smoke too many cheap cigars. <laughs> that's pretty funny. They got a picture of Brahms, kind of looking like a porcupine here. Interesting. Brahms never married, although he came close once. All those years playing piano in Sater's Bordellos had made a deep impression on his young mind. I'm afraid he gave him a rather scornful attitude towards women. According to some sources, much of his trouble came from the fact that his voice did not break until he was 24 years old. Whoa. Hmm. The woman he almost married was a singer named Agatha. They became unofficially engaged, but Brahms backed out at the last minute, telling her in a panic, I love you, but I cannot wear fetters. Heck is fetters. Although Brahms was born in Hamburg and worked for a time in Leipzig, he spent most of his life in Vienna. He lived the last 26 years of his life in the same apartment. Either he liked it or he was too lazy to move. He usually dined in his favorite pub, the Red Hedgehog. It was in Vienna that the young Brahms met Robert Schumann and his wife Clara. By this time, Schumann was beginning to hear strange noises. <laughs> In one of his few lucid moments, he wrote an enthusiastic, enthusiastic essay for his old music journal about how wonderful Brahms' music was. Brahms, meanwhile, was falling in love with Schumann's wife. Hmm. Many composers in his own day were inclined to dismiss Brahms as unimportant, since he always stayed with the old-fashioned classical forms and didn't explore new compositional techniques the way, say, Wagner did. Brahms felt that if it was good enough for Beethoven, it was good enough for him. But the Wagnerites thought he should expand his horizons. What his symphonies need, they would say, are a few robust Wagner tubas. In my books, 
In my books, Brahms is one of the greatest composers who ever lived since he wrote no opera, operas. Anyway, who avoids operas can't be all that bad. It was conductor Hans von Bülow who included Brahms as one of the three B's, along with Bach and Beethoven. Nowadays, this seems quite sensible, but in Brahms' time, the remark caused quite a commotion. No one agrees on who should be considered the fourth B if there is one. Have you noticed how many famous composers have names beginning with B? There's Binchwa, Bird, Buxtehude, Bach, Benda, Bocherini, Beethoven, Balakarev, Boradon, Berlioz, Bruckner, Bizet, Bartok, Britton, Baird, Bernstein, Berio, Boule, and of course Samuel Barber. I find this normally in, or I find this enormously inspiring. Okay, that's a little bit about Brahms. Probably more than you wanted to know. So, kids, we're um, we got some more composers to go over, but we're going to go ahead and call it a night. Time to get some sleep. So, in case you you um, forgot to brush your teeth, go in there and do it right now. Get a glass of water, brush your teeth, and then time to go back to bed. If you're fast and asleep and in a very deep sleep dreaming right now, having listened to this music history lesson, continue sleeping, and you can do all the aforementioned um, when you wake up in the morning. Good night.